Good afternoon, everyone. We're just about to start the session, uh, but I'll hang on for a one or two more minutes. So if you're very if you're very good at making speedy coffee, this is your chance. All right, I feel my back room organizers giving me the hurry up. All right, I would like to start the session and say hello and welcome. I am Margaret Jollins. I'm the Acting Dean of Learning and Teaching in the Cluster of Engineering and Technology at RMIT University in the, our, new, uh, our newly named STEM College. And it's my great pleasure to be your MC today and um, I hoping for a smooth technical process and a very and I am absolutely sure we're going to have very interesting uh, talks and I'm um, looking forward to great discussion afterwards as well. Uh, and so um, I would like to hand over at this point to introduce Professor James Harland who is going to tell us a little bit more about um, how the, uh, about the event and give us a, a welcome to country. Thanks James. Thank you, Margaret, and hello and welcome everyone, wherever you are. Look, on occasions like this, I think it's always good to pause for a few moments and reflect on the amazing history that we have here in Australia, and specifically the world's oldest living culture, because people have continuously inhabited this land for at least 60,000 years. That's an astounding amount of time, and one that makes comparisons with old buildings like European cathedrals or ancient cities like Damascus and Jericho seem, well, a little trivial. I think it's also easy for us here at RMIT in Melbourne, situated at the southeastern tip of this vast continent, to forget how large and varied this land is and how much of it is vastly different to what we see in our local area. With this in mind, as with a great sense of privilege that I say on behalf of everyone present that RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boon language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges all Indigenous ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. Furthermore, RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia and other parts of the world where we conduct our business. Now, just before I hand back to Margaret, next slide, please, Michelle, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of house rules. Firstly, please be aware that this event is being recorded. And secondly, the, for the Q&A session will be moderated by Margaret, but please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any time. But if your question is directed to one specific person, please add the name of the person in capital letters at the start of your question. Thank you for your attention. Now over to you, Margaret. Thanks very much, James. That was a very nice uh, acknowledgement of country. And uh, I must say here I am neglecting my MC duties. Uh, you have a glorious new title as well. So James is our newly minted director of STEM Centre for Digital Innovation um, at also in the uh, RMIT STEM College. Uh, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce um, Distinguished Professor Magdalena Plabatsky, who is the Director of the Biomedical and Health Innovation Enabling Capability Platform, otherwise affectionately known at RMIT as ECPs, and Head of the Translational Immunology and Nanotechnology Program in the School of Health and Biomedical Sciences in, our, in the STEM College. Thanks, Magdalena. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure um, to be allowed the opportunity to share some of the journey that the enabling capability platforms have had uh, during the times of COVID. Um, so next slide, please. Um, first of all, uh, if you don't know what an enabling capability platform is, it's, it's a construct within RMIT University to really build up cross-translational 
uh, cross-disciplinary strength against, across multiple schools and colleges so that then we are able to respond to external challenges and engage externally for impact. And this, this culture of really trying to do something good and um, do something across the disciplines is um, goes across um, multiple areas, including teaching uh, as well as research, as well as overall uh, engagement with industry and strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with COVID, um, the eight um, enabling capability platforms came together and um, really put our heads together. How are we going to try to respond to this enormous challenge? And uh, five initiatives were born, uh, Greener Start, Healthier Start, Digital Start, Better Work Start and Fairer Start, which uh, included multiple platforms um, to really try to engage this cross-disciplinary network, uh, the cross-disciplinary networks across multiple areas. In terms of um, the restart also, um, engage far more clearly uh, with the sustainable development goals and the indigenous ways of knowing um, as we go into the future, not just during COVID, but post COVID um, as, as a guiding principle. Next slide. So um, last year we um, were able to run a number of events uh, with industry, with students, um, support affiliates um, to write policy briefs, concept briefs, um, roundtables, workshops, um, applications for large scale funding. And this is um, this is where next slide, please. Um, as the uh, both digital start and and particularly the healthier start um, initiatives, we realize the the enormous um, toll that COVID was having on students and on educators, uh, particularly in their mental health. And um, one of one of the initiatives that um, has been set up within Healthier Start is uh, a mental health innovation network. Um, and the other big thing that obviously we and everybody else has come across is is the whole move to digital and how has that been impacting um, everything, research, education, strategy, planning for the future, planning for future careers. And um, within this context, um, we were very excited to support um, innovative um, mental health initiatives in, in digital health and, and really come across new initiatives in education as well. Um, a cross collaboration between the School of Psychology and the School of Education resulting in um, webinars made by the students to support students. This uh, background uh, really showed um, and showcased that, it, you know, education and really understanding education has so much uh, that has an input that is cross disciplinary, um, that is um, really engaging innovation and that we all need to talk to each other. And it's um, therefore with really um, enormous pleasure. And I'm also representing Matt Duckham, who's um, the new uh, director for the Digital Start. Um, we are just so excited to be able to support this event um, and um, hear um, the amazing innovations that our invited speakers are going to talk about. And also um, I'm very pleased to introduce and pass over um, to Angela um, who next slide please and the one after Michelle just jump that one <laughs> um, uh, Professor Angela Carboni who's the Associate Deputy Vice Chancellor of Learning and Teaching at um, the STEM College at RMIT University um, thank you Angela thanks Magdalena um, really appreciate you outlining the enabling capability platform restart initiatives and I'm delighted to be here to open the digital innovation and assessment and feedback event co-hosted by the STEM College and in conjunction with RMIT's enabling capability platform restart initiative. I think you know looking back over the past year 
Never has there been a time when so many of our educators had to rethink their pedagogy. The COVID-19 pandemic really forced academics to genuinely engage with new forms of online delivery and with new forms of technology. And now as we're starting to return to campus, universities you know, in Australia and around the world are really seizing the moment by reimagining the role of technology in learning and teaching. Last year, we had to rapidly pivot to online learning and all our face-to-face -face lectures no longer use the lecture theatres and we had to move away from those didactic approaches to teaching delivery, which was pretty much a good thing. And now that's really influencing how we teach today and it's going to influence how we engage with our learners post-pandemic. Academics um, are re redesigning their practical and laboratory activities to be delivered virtually, remote or, or simulated. And they're rethinking their assessments, especially to move away from those large scale invigilated written exams. And we see that across the board in, in Australia. But many of our academics are still grappling with what are the alternative forms of assessment and how to best um, how to best use the affordances of technology. So overall, the changes to manage the COVID-19 disrupt, disruption have, have led to, to question the way we operate. And assessment and feedback is absolutely crit a critical component of any course, um, which influences the student experience. And there are many incredible and interesting practices that were captured during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this event is going to showcase some of those innovations in digital assessment and feedback. So I am very much looking forward to the presentations from our two invited guests, Professor Robin Slatery from Monash University and Dr. Ed Pitt from the University of Kent in Canterbury, UK. I really hope that you all enjoy this event and it helps you to think about a digital start for 2021, even though we're already in March, but how we can uh, expand on the digital start we've already made and a healthier start. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it over to Margaret. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you, Angela. And uh, yeah, so let me just outline uh, a little bit more detail, a few more details about how the program will run. Um, so yes, as we've just heard from Angela, we're going to have two speakers who are talking about assessment and feedback and their um, innovative practice. And yeah, we're very, you know, very thankful for our, for Robin and Ed for joining the program today. Um, and after that, uh, there's going to be a uh, panel session where you get to ask your questions and we'll hear from the speakers and, and answering those questions. So just to remind you, please put your questions in the chat as we're going along. And then as uh, when we get to the panel session, I'll be asking those questions to um, our speakers. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker. Um, Professor, Professor Robin Slattery is the Professor of Immunology at the Alfred Hospital and the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Monash University. And uh, Robin's going to talk to us today about um, objective versus subjective methods to assess discipline specific knowledge. So thank you so much, Robin. Over to you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak today and I thank the organisers for the invitation to do so. Uh, next slide, please, Margaret. And the, 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 this uh, work that I'm going to present to you began about four years ago. And uh, I think the students uh, were, were giving me forewarning shots across the bow that one day we wouldn't be having any students in the lecture theatres because between first year and uh, third year, we noticed an incredible drop off so that out of a cohort of 100 students, we'd find that maybe 10 students were turning up to our lectures. They were listening online, but they were marching with their feet and telling us that's the way they wanted to learn. So uh, we were all about moving things online in about 2016 and also including the assessments online. Next slide, please, Margaret. So the, the, the way we approached this was to use extended matching questions. So extended matching questions are a really fancy form of multiple choice question. And this, this is an automated way to ask questions of students, but they're a bit more sophisticated than MCQs in that you can ask conceptual questions, differential diagnosis, that sort of thing. And so there, there were um, 
problems in our in some of our assessment practices that I had picked up. We, we would have six different tutorial groups, and one of the tutors uh, would have a mean mark uh, for their component of 75%, and another of our tutors, despite having a very clear rubric, would give a mark of 100 to everyone, thinking it was a popularity contest. And then we'd have all sorts of random marks along the way, and there was very little our relationship really for most of our assessors uh, in terms of those things that were assessed objectively by MCQs, the performance of the students in those tasks versus the subjective mark given by their tutor. And we felt that that needed to be redressed. And the second, which we'd all be familiar with, was the increasing uh, fiscal pressure put on universities, increased student numbers without increased resources, um, and marking long answer questions being costly, in terms of time and effort. And so we really wanted to automate this process to alleviate these time pressures. Um, we were aware that while students weren't turning up to lectures, they wanted to learn online. And in, and in Melbourne, where I teach, rents are high, students have to work, commutes are long. And so they'd think for, for a two hour lecture, I'd rather stay home. So there were all sorts of pressures on students. But we did realise that the students, you can't automate everything. I just want to say that right up front, that we realise students do need the relationship. And so we about what I'm going to tell you about in terms of automating was also balanced by um, an outreach to the students in a kind of a social setting, which I can speak to in the question time. Next slide, please, Margaret. So the format of the objective assessments had traditionally been multiple choice questions, and we introduced these more um, sophisticated extending matching questions. And then we and we introduced them slowly in, um, in uh, one of two units that were parallel units. And then we migrated um, them, we, we assessed the impact on the students, and then we began to migrate them into the second unit. And we analyzed the data across three or four, maybe even five years. So I'll take you through um, what those questions, what, what the multiple choice questions versus extended matching questions taught us about how students are learning. Next slide, please, Margaret. So uh, as I mentioned, um, multiple choice questions are well established. They're time efficient for staff. But what I have never liked about multiple choice questions is when I write these exams, having to come up with multiple spurious answers that were plausible but wrong. I felt like I was tricking the students, but I wanted to be on the same side as the students and really assist in their learning. And I think many people felt that way, that it almost was a, a dynamic of mistrust that you create when you try to create answers that students might select, you know, if they're tricked. Um, and the other thing I didn't like is that when students are under exam pressure and their anxiety levels are up, that the erroneous selection of an incorrect answer may reinforce false knowledge in the student uh, as they leave the exam. So for those reasons, I haven't really um, ever liked multiple choice questions, but because of the workloads involved in long answer questions, they have been used. So we switched, next slide please, Margaret. We switched to the extended uh, matching question. Um, and so the way, for those of you who haven't used these, there's, I can, and I've got an example we can talk about in question time if you want uh, more detail, particularly for writing um, conceptual questions. But basically a context statement is provided at the beginning of the question and that settles the student down. It reminds them of what they do know. And, um, and then, there's a series of, of answers, A to J or A to D or however many options that you want, all of which are correct. And these questions, if you have an A to J with a whole lot of different diseases, you can begin to ask questions of the students where they are required to differentiate in a more and more sophisticated way between those options. So is it, is it this disease or this disease? Because those symptoms could be A, or they could be B, and that student needs to think very, very in a nuanced way about what the answer is. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, uh, an example that's very simple for people to think about. At the introduction statement, Australia has approximately 730 bird species. These can be distinguished on the basis of colour, size and migration pattern. So you're telling the student what they already know. Birds sometimes found in towns and cities include, and then you give them a list of things that you've taught them already about these birds. So effectively what you're doing is you're giving them the answer to the old style exam. When you would normally ask a question, um, that's the answer they need to come up with, but you're actually providing that answer. 
And then you ask the question, the male of which species has a completely red head and easy, and you go from easier to more difficult questions. So this is really valuable in medicine with uh, differential diagnosis, but anything where you need the students to develop a very nuanced understanding of, of um, mechanistic pathways or diseases, etc. Next slide, please, Margaret. So then after we um, introduced this um, approach, and I will tell you that the students had a, a very bad reaction the first year that we introduced these, and I need to, to tell you what we did about that as well. So um, at the end of the exam, the first year I introduced it, I, I came home having invigilated the exam, um, I went to a jazz club, everything was fine. I left two hours later, I got home from the jazz club and there was about a hundred emails from students who'd started to talk to each other. The first one saying, oh, that was tough, that exam. The second one, yeah, that was tougher than usual. And on it went and, and, and by the end of it, the sky was falling in and, the, and I had um, uh, basically a coup going on. And I really needed to reassure the students that when they write a long answer question, you know, what are the what are the main causes of type one diabetes? They'll think, OK, well, I know that it's caused by the T cells and I know that there are antibodies involved and I know that it destroys the beta cells and and then I'll just kind of waffle and they come out thinking, oh, I think I did OK. But when you put the 10 things that you're looking for in the answer in the A to J or, or, or the list of options, and you ask students question and they can only answer three of those questions with confidence, they become very acutely aware of, of the fact that they didn't know as much as they should have known. And so then they panic. So that needs to be managed is what I'd say. But we basically, we analyze the outcome. So what you'll see here is um, at the top, the answers to uh, a question that's very easy. So on the x-axis here from, from the left to the right, you're seeing the students that overall perform badly and the students on the right-hand side that perform very well. And you can see that almost all of the students answered C to that question and, and got it correct. In the second example, you can see that the stronger students got the answer D correct, whereas the weaker students did not. Um, the third example is a more difficult question again, where you can see the slope of the curve changing. And then the final example I've given you there, where the answer is E, only the really top students were able to get that right. So you can write, you can basically tailor your EMQs um, from easy to difficult. And this feedback really helps to, to over the course of years to develop that, uh, a really nice exam and a balanced exam. Next slide, please. So what we did is um, we analysed the data. We looked at the mean mark for each student's performance um, when it was compared, comparing their MCQ and EMQs within a unit. We looked at their performance in two closely related units to see whether it changed anything. And we looked at subjectively the, the tutorial, the tutor's mark versus the objectively assessed task within the unit. And finally, we compared oral assessment tasks from different marker groups within the unit. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just quickly take you through the data to say that um, this is data from three examinations and a total of 150 questions comprising 40 MCQs versus 60 MCQs. And you can see in that graph there that there's very good correlation in performance between the easier uh, MCQ with the, with the problems that I described to you versus the EMQ, which all of the answers are correct and the state intro statement is correct and there's no tricking of the student. Um, and so then each student was compared to their average mark in the MCQ and EMQ, and there was this high correlation of um, coefficient. Next slide, please. Uh, we looked at increasing the objective assessment in units um, and whether it impacted on the unit performance. So did the students end up with a lower mean mark overall or not? And the answer is no, it did not impact that. It's a different style of asking the question, but basically the same cohort of the same students that did well in the previous style did well in the style of EMQ. And so you can see over the course of 2012 to 2016 that the mean mark really didn't change very much at all, uh, despite the increasing percentage of objective assessment. I will also add there, and I can talk to this in questions if people are interested, that we, we've put a lot of effort into reassuring students and teaching them how to answer EMQs. And in fact, we discovered along the way that that gave us an incredible tool for teaching not just for them to do well on the exam, but teach them about how to think about the content. So that, that was an added bonus. Next slide, please. The performance of students that were co-enrolled in a very similar unit, so first and second sem semester units the students do on closely related topics was compared. 
as a function of the percentage of objective assessment. And uh, essentially um, what we did is, uh, the, and they began with both having 25% objective assessment and they ended up, um, you can see that the one that was progressing fastest was the right-hand side unit, the second semester unit, where we introduced these changes, where we got the unit at the point of this, at 2016 at 72.5. We ultimately moved it to 100% um, of um, objective assessment. Next slide, please. Uh, so the objective assessment improved the correlation of student performance in related units. So this, this is a bit hard to see, but basically you've got on the x-axis you've got semester two performance and on the y-axis you've got semester one performance. And uh, going through the years, the top graph on the left there is 2012 and then you go down 2013, 14 and across to 15 and 16. And you can see a good correlation, uh, strong correlation uh, coefficient there in in all of those units. So objective assessment certainly improved consistency of student performance and the reproducibility of objective assessment over was far superior to that of subjective assessment. Next slide, please. Uh, so the objectively and subjectively awarded marks were poorly correlated. So we there were two, two approaches we took this. We looked at their written assessment and we looked at the oral assessment. And in both cases, there was a very poor correlation between student performance in, we, we were analyzing critical thinking, thinking problem solving, um, but nevertheless, we had very poor correlation. And when we drilled down on that, what we found is that it depended on the, the subjective assessor. So some of the subjective assessors actually had good correlation. So the graph site you have in front of you here relate to the whole cohort. But when we took out the individual tutor groups, what we found is um, a different story. So some assessors uh, in their subjective assessment actually had a very good correlation um, in a coefficient um, and, and others were very poor. And actually it related to seniority and experience in teaching. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we have um, one, two, three, four, our six tutors, uh, individual markers on the right hand side in the graph there. And actually there was, as I said, poor correlation um, between the marks awarded by five of these for the oral assessment task and those tasks awarded objectively. But assessor one, who is a very experienced teacher, um, was basically able to award a mark to the students in that tutor group that was predictive of their exam mark. She understood exactly what they knew and didn't know and wasn't sort of um, bluffed, if you like. Uh, I will also tell you that assessor two that gave all of her students 100% was very popular and assessor one was very unpopular with the students. Um, so the variance in the awarded marks across these different uh, assessors was not significantly correlated. So it, it does suggest marker bias is an important contributor um, to this problem. Next slide, please. So I'll just finish and, and um, really leave think, um, a lot of this for question time, but the EMQs are a valid method uh, to objectively assess students. There are massive time efficiencies to staff during peak workloads. I mean, all of my colleagues would be there when the truckload of exams came in um, to mark them and within an hour I would have the answers and have the marks posted. So I would be going around and helping my colleagues convincing, trying to convince them anyway, to move to this automated assessment process. And this has been fantastic during COVID, absolutely fantastic because it's pretty much bulletproof in terms of cheating and, and we can talk about techniques uh, that we've used to, to stop cheating. Uh, there's increased inclusion of EMQs in assessment, increases the consistency of student marks. Subjective assessment of science communication skills introduces marker bias, and this remains a problem because the things that you can assess, you can assess through really fantastic EMQs in terms of differential diagnosis still do not measure a person's ability to communicate science well, and I, I think that still needs work and it's um, a direction that we're, we're looking at going. So I think that's it from me. That, that's my last slide. Um, just maybe progress it, Margaret, to, um, to check that that's the case. Uh, but I think questions is for the end. Yes, that's right. So thank you for your time and attention. I'll hand back to you, Margaret. Thank you very much. Um, Robin, that was absolutely fascinating. I, I am just uh, so desperate to find out how to write E, E, EMQs, EMQs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, quite a few questions in the chat about that as well. So we will get to that later. 
Um, if you'd like to put questions in the chat while they're in your mind, this is your chance, please do so. And then we'll get back to them at the end. Um, so uh, now I would like to introduce our next speaker who is uh, Dr. Ed Pitt from, uh, who is Program Director for the Postgraduate Certificate in Higher Education and uh, Associate Professor in Higher Education and Academic Practice at the University of Kent, Canterbury in the UK. So Ed absolutely gets the award for getting up the earliest to attend this event. It's very early in the UK at the moment. So thank you so much, Ed. Um, Ed's going to talk to us about dilemmas in implementing online feedback, sifting the evidence for practical application. Thanks, Ed, over to you. Uh, thanks, Margaret, and uh, I'm really honoured to be able to speak at this event, uh, even though it is early in the UK. Uh, Michelle, can I have the next slide, please? So, as, as Margaret said, I'm going to be looking at specifically feedback. Um, now, some of this research that I'm going to report today was uh, pre-COVID, uh, but I think this is something that we perhaps need to consider uh, as we navigate post-COVID. Uh, we've had a year, um, but I think some of the lessons that we've learned from the last year are probably going to be fairly enduring, and it's very unlikely that we're going to go back to the way that things were uh, pre-COVID. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm going to promote uh, three dilemmas uh, today and um, give you some idea about where the literature is taking us and how that might impact the way that we we play out with feedback with our with our students. Um, I think it's important to start with, though, that we reflect on the goal that technology enhanced feedback has. Um, when in the UK this this uh, pandemic hit last March, it was very, very quick for, for people to say, oh, well, we can just stick everything online. But I think we need to be very mindful of the way that that may operate and the behaviours that that may instill with our students if we don't think about the way that we design these features into our into our curricula and how that might affect their behaviour with assessments. And as David Carlos from, from Hong Kong has talked about in the last few years, the essence of feedback should really be about dialogue. And that is one of the things that I'm going to consider today as I, as I, as I progress this talk. We want our students to engage with the feedback and what we actually want them to do is to self-monitor their own progress and enact the feedback and utilise it. But what we have a problem with is that sometimes written feedback from students can be perceived as rather one way, and it has to almost carry all of the burden of the teacher-student interaction. So I guess my concern when we, we said, oh, let's put everything online, was that it was going to reinforce the teacher-driven uh, canon of feedback, if you like. The more we shoot towards the students, the better they'll be become. But I think we have to think about this in a different way, particularly if we consider uh, some of our Australian colleagues, colleagues there, Dave Bad and Liz Malloy, around the monologic transmission of feedback comments, not on its own facilitating learning. There is more to this. And actually what we want to happen is students to be using the feedback uh, and seeking feedback rather than it just being the role that the, 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 the teacher provides that being crucial. So next slide, please. So I looked at the literature around technology use and uh, Stuart Heppelston there has talked about a growing number of studies supporting the hypothesis that technology has the potential to enhance student engagement with feedback. And we see over the last 10 years, lots and lots of literature, both online and face to face around the idea of engagement. And I think we have to think about what does engagement mean? Is that the student accessing it or is that the student enacting it? And I think they're very different things. So in one respect, the technology has facilitated easier access for students. We've seen it used for formative feedback. It's very quick for students to get feedback from, from lecturers. Um, there are peer-to-peer uh, -peer feedback systems that are available where uh, students can upload work, peers can comment, and they can use uh, combined documentation, for example. Google has an excellent suite for, for, for that. And also what we've seen in the last couple of years is again from Australia um, with Avalado Pardo in, in Sydney, using learning analytics uh, and the power of learning ana analytics to generate, generate individualized feedback. And that software is still in development, but it is freely available and I can point people towards that at the, at the end of this talk. Really the sense that, um, like Robin was talking about, some of the answers that students might give to, say, for an, uh, for example, an MCQ, 
this uh, software will actually generate feedback that appears to the student to be individualized. So there will be lots of relational elements within that feedback. The feedback will point them towards areas of development that they might need to look at if they get incorrect answers. So it's a more nuanced level of, of feedback that relates to perhaps questions that might be seen as yes or no or correct, incorrect. So this has happened in, in the sciences. So, so technology can be a really great thing, but we have to be careful about what it can actually sometimes uh, reinforce in terms of behaviours from students. Next slide, please. So I wanted to look at the, the probably the most obvious one was uh, the audio versus written feedback. In the UK, we use uh, Turnitin and within Turnitin, it has uh, something called Feedback Studio. And this is what we generally mark a lot of our work on. And there is a little widget on the right hand side for our for our uh, software that you can record three minutes of um, uh, audio. Now, most people have uh, software and most people have the hardware to be able to do that now. And it's become the norm for us to operate online in the last 12 months. So we've seen an increase in digital delivery of audio feedback, but we've also seen a progression towards video and screencast. Now, one of the things that we hope that Turnitin will, will develop is the ability to add those audio comments alongside a, uh, a video screencast. So for those of you who don't know, this would be live marking where it essentially records you working through a student's piece of work and it will drop the comments, show the cursor, and this will all sit within the Feedback Studio software rather than having to use peripheral software and uploading. So it streamlines the process. And what research has told us is that students feel that audio feedback uh, is more detailed, uh, it becomes across as more personalised and it's easier to comprehend. However, if you look at some of the other research on uh, audio feedback, a lot of staff that uh, were asked about how they uh, practice in this actually said that they, they write scripts and merely uh, audio deliver the written feedback that they would give. And this is something around the, the, the mode of, of feedback delivery that, that, that we have to kind of understand, I think, in a greater detail about how the audio delivered uh, can be easier to comprehend and more detailed if, in fact, it is the same type of feedback that would have been written down. So there's something in the way that students are processing uh, the feedback. We, we're not surprised to see that things like uh, more supportive in tone comes back from students around their views of audio feedback. I think one of the issues around written feedback is that sometimes the, the tone and the meaning can be misconstrued. I think also if we think about the way that we've probably all operated online in the last year, the idea of visual uh, through, the, through the video is also another way of us um, getting students to understand where the emphasis is and where the support is and where those relational elements that sometimes are really hard to, to achieve in, in written feedback. Some research from the UK, uh, from, from, from Surrey, suggests that students' uh, engagement was more superior. And I think this is something that, that I'm personally very interested in. When we see that 78% of students were more likely to take action or revisit the feedback if it was delivered in an audio way. And I think there's something in the behaviour of our students. Most of us are now teaching students that have, have grown up this century. Um, the, the, the way that they access technology and engage with technology is very different to, to perhaps you and I did when we were at the undergraduate level. So, so how we understand how those individuals view feedback and how they use that medium of feedback, I think there's lots of more research for us to, to, to do on that. Next slide, please. So my first dilemma with uh, technology enhanced feedback is whether um, we move from uh, transmission to uptake. And what students are telling us is that it feels like a conversation. And this is a bit of a strange uh, perception to have because in this research, this feedback was actually just an audio file that was delivered to a student. So actually there was no conversation at all. It was all one way. But in the student's mind, it felt like the lecturer was talking to them and they were talking back. Very strange. So as, as this example says, it was a personal address to me and my coursework, quite like sitting in John's office and getting him to explain what I needed to do. So again, the mode of feedback changes the perception of the effectiveness and the usefulness for the student. And the relational dimension of feedback is something that's been a real concern for us in the UK. Socially distanced teaching, just having our students fully online is something that's quite a departure from the way that most people in the UK will have operated. 
The idea of personalization, nuance and informal engaging language was something that we definitely promoted with our staff to try and get our students to feel like there was a connection and a relationship between the educator and the students. But also what we've seen in some of the earlier literature on this is that it has an enhanced presence of the lecturer. So again, this mode of feedback, although it is very monologic, does change the way that students perceive the feedback, which for some lecturers was probably the first barrier in getting students to understand why feedback could have a positive impact upon their learning. So for them, the mode actually improved the situation, even though the actual delivery of it was very, very similar to the written feedback. Next slide, please. The second dilemma is around the practical and pedagogical concerns. I'm acutely aware I, I work with um, new academics and uh, existing uh, academics that have tenure. And the first point that they normally raise when you talk about any new innovation is, well, how much workload is this going to increase? What's the impact that's going to have on my practice? And yes, I must highlight at the start, for some people, there is a steep learning curve whenever they take on any new innovation, and especially when they're trying to maybe grapple with new technology. But one of the, uh, I think, the uh, the factors that we, we have to consider is that the idea that this becomes a little bit more time efficient for, for, for academics. There's some research there from now 11 years ago is that we can speak in one minute that which would take six minutes to write. And I think where the, where the, uh, the worry lies for, for most academics is that um, you have to have a really polished uh, delivery. And this goes back to my earlier point around people making uh, speeches and um, a sort of a, a, a script that they would um, that they would audio deliver. Um, most people that have had success with this uh, type of feedback actually say, I just do it off, off the hoof. I say as I mark, I record as I go through, I refer to pages. Um, for example, Turnitin gives you three minutes. Now, three minutes to deliver feedback is quite a long uh, time. Um, it would probably uh, be, uh, I would say, maybe five to six hundred words of written feedback that you could speak in three minutes. Um, and I think that's that's quite a long time. Um, but the student perhaps feels like they've they've had a real good experience from the lecturer because the lecturer has spent lots of time time reading it. Whereas all they're doing is is sort of thinking aloud as they mark. So one of the ways that um, this, this is a little bit concerning, though, is the, the idea of a trans, uh, transmission focused mindset. So as I, as I say in the quote here, to get me to get the feedback from my teacher, like face to face, I'm going to have to make an appointment and I go and see him and he doesn't have time. He's just going to have to rush through it sort of thing. But now I have it all the time and I can watch it whenever I want. You know, that's much easier for me. I prefer doing it that way, to be honest. And I think this speaks to the mindset of some of the students in that uh, effort expenditure um, in terms of going in to make an appointment, um, having to sit there for them to, to, to deliver that and not having captured that moment, perhaps, is something that these students are telling us they, they, they don't want. And I think the last 12 months has perhaps um, reinforced these different ways of doing things where lots of things are delivered at distance. And I wonder how enduring that's going to be in terms of the expectations of our students in that they want to have um, things that they can return to. However, what I would say back to this student is clearly the written feedback was always there for them to go back to as well. But it just seems that the, the, for, the, for those students that were interviewed there, the audio seems to be a more accessible resource. And maybe that again speaks to the, the idea that um, this is something they're more used to. They're very much engaged with their with their technology, their mobiles, etc. And maybe this is, is, is the reason why they see this as a more preferable option um, in terms of the mode. Next slide, please. My final dilemma is around student satisfaction or student uptake. The UK is incredibly obsessed with student satisfaction. The mantra that you can't upset your students is something that I hear very often when we are teaching uh, new lecturers to, to HE. Um, the face-to-face -face dialogue for some students can be rather uncomfortable and troublesome. And this speaks to the idea that we can't put students in uncomfortable situations because it might upset them. I think the very heart of learning is that there are going to be bumps in the road. 
the idea that you can't you can go through an entire degree program and not have difficult moments I perhaps is, uh, is is a utopian I think you learn most from your adversity and I think being put into difficult situations where you have to defend your work or maybe hear difficult things that you uh, that you don't want to hear about your your work is something that is 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 a real skill for for individuals to leave higher education with so we're talking about resilience here so I think um, the way that uh, that the the um, the, the, the one way monologic, as I've talked about already today, um, how that is reinforced by not having to see lecturers and have discussions. We have to be mindful of that. And I think one one thing that Teams and, and Zoom and all these other things has has promoted is that it is quite easy just to quickly drop on and have um, almost a, an online uh, lobby where students can come in and speak to you about their work is, is something that maybe is a little bit more accessible. Um, what we've got to be careful of is those ideas of power imbalance around the limitations of students' understanding and how much they are willing to be put on the spot. So I think this is a scaffolded process where you can't just do one-off iterations of this. It has to be built into the programme. So it becomes the expectation and the norm in, in that discussions around work and feedback and, and, and how those iterations are, are modified as, as students move through their work should be something to promote. I've already talked about students liking or preferring it. That is perhaps uh, um, uh, attractive to, to, to some people. Um, and it's more congenial or less ominous to embrace oral formative feedback in an audio visual feedback environment. Students are telling us they like to receive it in that way. And, and my last slide, please, Michelle. So I just wanted to say about a way forward, really, um, and, and it's three points around the design stance or whether we can create opportunities for students to use feedback in subsequent assessments. I think at the heart of, of great feedback design is great assessment design, thinking about how our curricula affords opportunities for students to use feedback. After all, of what I've said today, there's li very little value if there's no op opportunity for students to implement this feedback in subsequent assessments built across programmes. We're also seeking the value added of audiovisual feedback around us appearing to be more supportive and approachable and breaking down those relational barriers so that the students feel like this is a partnership um, between staff and students and that we're all moving in the same direction through those supportive and sometimes challenging dialogues. And finally, about an audiovisual feedback being a stimulus, not a replacement for face to face dialogue. We don't want to get in the situation after this last year where we don't meet in person and we don't talk. That would be a real sad indictment of the pandemic. But we, we need to think about how audio visual feedback might be a stimulus for these interactions, perhaps asking uh, students questions through their feedback and increasing a dialogue. And one of the ways that we've used this, um, particularly in my own research, is interactive cover sheets where students ask us for specific feedbacks on things that they've either been told in the past to work on or areas that they want to specifically gain feedback on that they've tried. And that starts the dialogue and students can get directed feedback in the marking from the from the academic as they move through. OK, I've, I've had my time, so back over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, that's just really fascinating and I can see lots of interest from people asking questions in the chat as well. So I just want to thank both uh, both of our speakers uh, for that fascinating insight to their, their topics. Um, and now it's over to uh, uh, answering some of the questions from you. So I'm going to um, select questions based on the number of likes. So if you want to see your question liked, you're going to rush on and give it five likes. No, don't do that. Um, like the questions, have a look through the questions and uh, bump them up. But I'm going to open. Um, let's return first to Robin. Robin, there's lots of questions in the chat around the topic of how you develop the EMQs. Like I think we're sold on the idea of what a great idea it is, but we're wondering, you know, that the process um, you've developed, how much work was it to develop? Um, and can you, is there some more examples somewhere, perhaps in some published work? Thanks, Margaret. Um, they're really good questions. And part of, uh, so the, the first part of the answer is that they do take time to develop. And one of the things that was really striking to me when I was convincing my colleagues that this was the way to go, because they saw me heading off to the pub when they were still marking exams, so that was a great incentive, um, that they actually, many of them, some of them were able to write them very I wouldn't say easily, but with a little bit of um, mentoring and others struggled and struggled. And 
And it's an interesting question as to why, and I think it's the same reason that some of our students perform well on them and some don't. So the way we write them is the same way that I teach students how to answer them because we, ne we need to mentor students in how to, how to approach these questions. So we write the question up, we, the old fashioned question. And so the old fashioned question, um, or, or we, you know, um, I think I've got an example up there that you could put up and share with people. But, you know, we've got a problem. There's, there's um, uh, this rainbow man is making tattoos and the people that were in San Francisco were starting to get immunocompromised. And we tell a story and we ask students in immunology to say, why might this be the case? And they might say, well, it's because of a virus on the needle or it's because of uh, the, 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 those people were immunocompromised or it's because of this or it's because of that. And then we say, OK, fantastic. You've answered that question with your long, old fashioned style answer. Let's get the rubric out and let's in front of you, let's mark that. And we go tick, 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 tick. There's 10 key points and there's 10 out of 10 for that student. And so what we do then is we put those 10 key points up as A, B, C, D. They're the answers, right? So we put the 10 up there. We, we, we give a little bit of an introduction to those 10 answers saying there's a, there's a disease that we don't understand. We'd like to understand. There are a number of possible explanations, including A, B, C, D, E, and down we go. And then I say to the students, ask a question, write a question, and I get the students and, I, and put them into effectively what is teams, like you're at a trivia pursuit night, and they love that, they get competitive. And so they're writing these questions that can only have one answer. And when they do that, they have written an EMQ and I say to them, I'm gonna use some of your EMQs in the exam. And I even go so far as to tell the students, uh, we are going to use this string and this A, B, C, D, E, and I tell them that's what it that's what it's on. And they, they think you're marvellous because you've given them the answers. But as we all know, what's far more difficult than the correct answer is asking the right question. And when you get a student to ask the right question, you're asking them to think differentially about the content and you're teaching them actually how to think and how to approach their learning. So they enter the exam room super confident because their lecturer has given them the answers and they, they, they know how to focus their study. But it's also the way that I teach the lecturers to write EMQs. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Robin. Um, so you mentioned that some some of your colleagues have some difficulty in learning how to do this. So presumably they also have students that they can ask the questions to. So how, how what what's your idea about why um, or what do you advise them if they're if they're not getting the answers that they wanted? Uh, what do you advise them to do next? Well, the, the, if you're speaking about the colleagues, what I do is I, I go through the content with them and I sit down and, and I write with them until they kind of get the swing of this because it's kind of the inverse way of thinking about a question. You're giving the answer and then you, you're, you're writing the questions after the fact. And so I ask them to think about in immunology, I'll think I'll say, think about a group of cytokines and the group of cytokines will be your A, B, C, D, E. And then which disease is it um, you know, you've, you've got an allergic response and it's caused and these cells are coming in, which cytokines are most likely to be responsible for that? And so it means that the student and, and the lecturer who's thinking about their content is thinking about categories of uh, cytokines or categories of molecules or categories of pathways and the various different ways um, that, you, that, that that is the correct answer. So what they have to do is think across the contents um, to distinguish between this group of cytokine or this cytokine and that cytokine, if that if that makes sense. So it, the other thing about EMQs is it allows you to ask integrated questions, not a single set of questions about a single lecture, but a set of questions across a theme. So uh, questions that cut across a whole lot of questions. So in terms of training people to write them, the answer is I mentor them, sit down with them. And I, do, I think it's very important when anyone writes an EMQ, even someone experienced, that that EMQ is passed through several colleagues to check that it's not ambiguous. And then finally, once it's actually passed three colleagues and decided to be a good EMQ, that we do the item and analysis to check afterwards to make sure that it hasn't caused confusion and that in fact, the stronger students are getting it correct and the weaker students may not be. Okay, thank you. 
All right, now I'm going to move to a question for, for Ed. So Ed, there's, there's uh, several questions in the chat and I'll start with the first one. And that's, um, there's, it's really piqued interest here at this idea that audio feedback is so superior to written feedback, but then to think about video feedback compared to audio feedback. Um, so one of the questions is about, um, does this, uh, does the comparison of audio versus written feedback, does it depend on whether the, the, um, the student is English first language if the marker is English first language? Assuming markers are giving feedback in English, does it depend on, um, for the student, does it depend on what their first language is? Does the research say anything about that? Yeah, so I, I, we, we didn't see anything um, uh, that, that distinguished that, um, but I think there are issues around both of those areas from whether the practitioner, uh, their first language is in English, and also whether the student's uh, first language is English. Um, and I think the ways that feedback are, are delivered um, can sometimes cause students that have come to a different academic environment uh, some challenges. Uh, I've got a PhD student at the moment who's, who's looking at um, students that have come from Europe to the UK and their whole feedback system in Europe is different to the UK in, in southern Europe, for example, and, and actually understanding the, 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 the ways and practices of feedback is a real barrier. So I think for that, for that particular uh, research, it didn't really matter about the mode because it was about the understanding. Of, of what constitutes feedback in that particular environment that was actually more of a barrier. And I think I think this is the thing with a lot of this work that looks at, at um, technology enhanced feedback. I mean, it's, it's quite superficial in terms of it does seem to focus more on whether students like it. Uh, so you'll see lots of it that says, oh, yeah, the students were really happy. They were more satisfied, whereas I don't think we've really interrogated the actual learning potential of of this medium and i think that's far more important so there's only one study that i can recall which is by a, a guy called paul orsmond from from staffordshire uni in the uk that actually shows um a change in 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 behavior as a result of the feedback that was delivered audio and i think that was back in 2008 uh, the rest of it is is so focused on student satisfaction and i think that's a real problem if if we just continue to reinforce that that that, that this um area of feedback is about satisfaction rather than learning so i think there's definitely work for us to do on that and i think maybe there might be more uh, opportunity given that more people are, are engaging with this type of of way of delivering feedback um in the last 12 months that we that post pandemic we really start needing to question whether or not this this is having any potential learning positives for, for students in terms of uptake and enactment yes let's try not to forget learning in all this uh, discussion um, sometimes it can be hard, can't it? Um, so yeah. there's a corollary. Another part of that question, uh, or a similar question, is so the research on audio versus video feedback. Do 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 you assume that video is going to be better than audio? Is there anything to support that? Yeah. Again, um, it, it it seems to be focused on presence, um, and some people like the idea that that their lecture is there visually um it, it it if you look if you look at some of the early work on this it does tend to have a a change in mindset about the uh, about the feedback in that the, the personalized dialogue is is a perception even though these are pre-recorded videos you know these are not live like we would now do if I had your work in front of me, Margaret, I could I could do a live sort of uh, discussion and mark. The, these are pre-recorded, so there isn't a dialogue, but there's a there's a there's an impression that that it is. Um, and, and this is a strange dynamic um, that, that we don't really understand in terms of the, the, the so what afterwards. And someone's talked about transferable skill development, retaining knowledge. And I think that's something that we've really got to look at um, in an experimental sense so that we can really get to the to the grip. So there's some great work coming out of, of Aston and Surrey around memory um, in terms of types of feedback and, and future orientated and past orientated and the effect that that has on, on memory. And I think we need to look at the different modes. Most of that was on written feedback. We need to perhaps look at whether the audio or the visual or combined audio visual, the effect that that has on students. So I think, I think it is an under-researched and under-theorized uh, area. Um, We've, we've got some impetus because of the satisfaction driver, but I think we, if we really want to progress this and, and understand this mode, we've, we've got to do more 
uh, more empirical work on this. So on the topic of empirical of work, we've got a question for Robin, which um, you did answer in the chat, but I wondered if you could expand on it um, about um, it was really interesting to see the lack of correlation between the subjective and objective marking. Um, do you think that could be turned into a tool that we could use to meant, uh, to um, evaluate the learning of new teaching academics? Because that's always an issue and new teaching academics are learners, of course. Um, so do, your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a really good question, Margaret. So uh, I only, unfortunately, I only had one really strong correlation, a tutor that had strong correlation between objective and subjective assessments. And the feedback from the students for that uh, assessor was um, was so negative that she actually left teaching. Um, but but before she left teaching, I asked her because the students criticised her. She was she was very uh, straight down the line. But um, I asked her if she would mentor the other tutors. And so we looked at the way she assessed her students and the metrics that she was using and the rubric she was using. And she sat with the other tutors to to mentor them in that space. But I will say that I don't feel that that was tremendously uh, successful in that iteration. And um, partly I think that uh, in, at, at Monash University, we, we the students um, give feedback on teachers and those set you feedbacks, as we call them, are very important in promotion. And so sometimes tutors are seduced by wanting to get high um, favorable feedback from students in order to get promotion and that, and that um, perverts uh, what we're trying to do to some extent. So in the second iteration, what we've done is that that tutor that was so good originally has now come on board in our online learning space and creates avatars for the teachers so that when there's an EMQ that's automated and it's online and the student does it and they click the wrong answer, the avatar of the teacher uh, can pop up and say, good effort, but actually the nuanced here answer is here that you've got to distinguish between the red feathers and the blue feathers and right at the tip. And that's why uh, D is correct instead of C. And so we have this inbuilt feedback with this somewhat humorous avatar that looks a little bit like their teacher and it depersonalizes, adds, adds humor, but we've got the teacher there that really has the ability to do that too. So that's how we've solved it. Okay, thank you. That's a uh, lots lots of um, brain uh, ideas popping in my head about that. Um, Ed, a question for you that's kind of related to that. So David asked, what about uh, getting students to give peer feedback using audio or, or videos? Ha have you looked at that or do you know of anybody who's looked at that? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think that's uh, is David Carlos who I mentioned at the start and I think this is um, this is really important. I think anything that gets students active with feedback within the curriculum is something that is really, really important for us to encourage. Um, I think, as I said earlier in that talk, you know, the idea that we as academics are the ones that have to provide all the feedback is something that we, we I think would be a benefit to move away so that students actually see the benefit of generating uh, and giving feedback to their peers and also understanding how the feedback that they get from their peers um, is, is in relation to their own work. So this inner, inner feedback idea. And, and I have got some examples where um, David and I have been doing some work with, with the performance arts. And when we collected a lot of the research for that, that happened in normal times. Um, now, the very notion of performance, you need to be able to see what people are doing. So um, when we were in lockdown in the UK, these subjects um, thought about this in a slightly different way and actually got the students so that it was from comedy, drama, etc. Um, they actually got the students to record with their own devices the videos that they were they, they were going to do, um, their performances, and then they uploaded them and then they engaged in uh, peer feedback. So students tasks in the interim weeks were to go online and view two or three videos of their of their peers, generate feedback for those and post that and then in subsequent weeks the the students had to um, talk about when the start of their video how they've how they've utilized the feedback from previous weeks from their peers and now th this happened in in their sessions anyway normally before the pandemic but the technology allowed them to continue that way of, of operating um, during during the difficult 12 months and I think that was one of the ways that they quickly thought that technology could facilitate that now, there's a little bit more work involved, obviously, because you've got to record and upload, etc. But the, the system is there for that to, to happen. 
So I think you still can do performative areas uh, at distance. And obviously at the end of it, they can they can do their um, their final performance and, and the and the academics can mark that um, that video. So so there is there is ways of, of the technology being great for that. Now, I think one of the points I'm sorry to, to go on, but in there about um, calibrating peer feedback. And I think that's one of the things that if you look at the literature on that, you, you have to give students lots of opportunities to engage with that. It can't just be a one off um, uh, opportunity that you think, oh, well, they'll, they'll get that from there. It does take time. It does take scaffolding. And, and we would always advocate starting that quite early to get students to be more familiar um, with, the, with what they should do so that you don't get those superficial. Oh, that was nice. I enjoyed that. You really want that to sort of be that critical uh, feedback that can have an effect upon on the students learning as you move through the years. Sounds a bit like Robin's tutors who were currying favour by giving their students high marks. Yes, I'm sure, um, you know, young 20 somethings are also uh, interested in, in, in that perhaps. Um, but just um, there's a, another question for you, Ed, uh, which is about, um, and I've been thinking about this, whether there's a dif discipline specific element of this. So for performing arts, obviously, you know, video feedback sounds like it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, but for um, so the question is about if you've got um, a discipline where written work is is the authentic work, where written work is something where the transferable skills are, are needed to be evidenced. Um, so would you give audio feedback on work where we're really trying to develop writing skills? Yeah. I guess um, that is the case. Um, however, if you think about uh, the work of an academic, uh, we have to deliver our, our work in lots of different mediums. So we will have written uh, work, but we'll also have audio delivery. So I think if we want people to be uh, graduates that can move into the, uh, to the world of work, there are going to be lots of instances where they aren't just going to get written feedback all of the time on their work. They are going to get oral feedback. So I think maybe the idea of having that on your written work is, is, a, is a key skill to develop being able to process feedback in that way as well as the written. Um, I mean, you could you could say that if someone really hated the oral feedback and you were trying it, you could always get the, transcri the transcription and, the, and they could have that in written form. You know there, there are elements of that and I think also you know that that there are um, uh, uh, disability awareness elements of oral feedback um, and you can have closed captioning. I don't, there's mixed success on that at the moment um, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to look at their closed captions from a recorded lecture it does throw in the odd word here and there so you have to go back through it but I think that that software again is getting better um, so you could offer almost both. You could have the audio delivery, but you could also have a transcript if if students didn't want to to have to um, to listen to the audio. So I think, yeah, I think I, I, this disciplinary element, I think the ways and means in, in subjects is something that we, we need to understand a little bit more as well. But equally, you know, you can challenge the way that, that certain things happen in, in subjects. If, it, if it's always been that way, it could be that, that a, a slight change might improve student learning um, as, as they move through their, their course in that discipline. Mm. I was just thinking engineers are a uh, predominantly very visual, so I'm, I'm wondering how they would go with um, audio feedback. But um, there's mm. a, a leading question for, for Robin about um, in your your discipline, we presume not that we're experts in your discipline, but in your discipline, um, the kind of questions you ask might have a have a, a one correct answer. Um, engineering would be similar, but the question from our um, audience is, do you see, can you apply EMQs as well um, in sub where there's more subjective answers. So in, in disciplines where there isn't a, a right answer, but there might be multiple answers. Uh, that's an excellent question. And actually we have done this. Um, for example, one of the EMQs that was, one of the questions that we used to ask on an exam and it's out there in the community now, so I'll speak about it, uh, in the discipline of immunology was, the Tasmanian devils are dying at a great rate. They've got facial tumours. Uh, cancers aren't usually transmissible, but it seems to be cancer seems to be spreading through uh, the the Tasmanian devils. Why might this be the case? And students would write about that. And there's a number of 
potential explanations for that, N none of which we, we didn't at the time the question was written know the answer. It wasn't a black and white thing. We were asking the students to be problem solvers and, and to come up with plausible reasons for that. You know, they were immunosuppressed or they'd, they'd got some virus or that there was a bottleneck because there were so few that they were, they, the, the Tasmanian devils were really similar genetically to each other. So there were these various options, but there was not, you would never be able to look up a textbook and find a correct answer. But the way the question was written was, you need to give a plausible, the most plausible answer. So we were asking students really, as if they were in the workplace, workplace being a scientist to think about you know plausible hypothesis and when we marked that exam we did the Iceman analysis and actually um, students performed very well on it that the top students did certainly and then sometimes we would see two answers on a certain thing and I'd look back at it and think actually actually you got to pay that and so we actually made it that we would pay either of those answers. So I guess that is an entree into answering your question to say that you could have two correct answers and you can set your machinery up to measure it that way. That's that's uh, that's very interesting how that would extend, but I presume that we would need people from those disciplines to, to go into that in more detail and because obviously what, what you've done has taken some time to develop in your own discipline and so um, that would be really interesting to see it applied in other disciplines. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, we've answered um, a lot of the questions and I think there was a question, maybe this is for Ed about to go back to, as you mentioned, it can be, it's important to calibrate peer feedback. Um, and you can do that by scaffolding. So I wondered if you might expand on how you can help students to um, to calibrate their peer feedback. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> I think one of the ways that I've seen this work really well is 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 getting students to um, see lots of examples of of quality to start with. Um, so uh, that could be um, from professional level high class work or more accessible through previous work that students have done in, in previous years um, and getting them to see how that relates to the criteria and then going through a process of, 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 of identifying how that criteria might play out in that piece of work. Um, and I think once you've got students to calibrate their understanding of the criteria and, and the expectations, you can then move them through to to looking at their own work. Um, so it could be that you that you have some formative tasks that are related to the, the summative assessment and actually getting students to produce uh, pieces of, of work. Um, I think it was back in even, I think it was 1989, Roy Sadler at Griffith University talked about this, of getting students to write weekly and getting students to comment on, on, on each other's work. Um, you know, the idea that we get students to do things um, is, is something that I have a, have a battle with a lot of my colleagues uh, around because um, it's sort of, oh, well, we can't get them to do more work. But I think that the act of actually doing is sometimes a real benefit to, to students rather than just having it all loaded on that high stakes endpoint assessment. So, so, you know, the more opportunities they can see how that feedback can improve iterations as they move through, I think is 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 something that's a real benefit, and 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 it's David Nichol that says it's more cognitively engaging to generate feedback for someone else than it is just to receive it. So I think the act of of saying why something is good or bad, for instance, is is something that's a real challenge, and 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 I think that's where we see see the the, the most benefit. So fascinating. My brain is just buzzing with all these ideas, and um, I, I must say, I think it's rather clever of us. Um, I, I hadn't realised to this moment that where Robin is talking about assessment and you're talking about feedback, they're just marrying up in my brain. So, so in so many points. So I'm just thinking, I love that Robin's idea about uh, the trivial pursuits way of writing questions, and I thought, I wonder you could do video. You could get students to to give them four pieces of videos of different um, qualities and get them to market in a trivial pursuit where they had to get the right answers and, um, <laughs> and, and different things. You, you could also get them to produce videos of different quality, You're reversing, the, reversing the, the process instead of producing good quality, get them to produce a past quality or something. Anyway, that's just uh, possibly because I'm, I'm, um, I've had too much coffee today, but I um, it is um, very close to time. I have my two minutes to uh, give closing remarks and acknowledgements. 
Um, and so it's really my pleasure to have emceed this uh, session and especially to have chaired these, these, uh, um, this panel session with the questions. Um, great questions from the audience. So my first acknowledgement is thank you to the audience for such great questions. Um, of course, um, our, our, my greatest thanks is to our two wonderful speakers. So Ed and Robin, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, um, not only did you keep to time, but you've kept us enthralled all the way through um, and that provided these rich uh, crop of questions. Um, I would also really like to acknowledge the back the backroom team who have worked so hard to put this together, um, and that is Jeff and Michelle, um, without whom none of this would be taking place in anything like this uh, smooth smooth uh, process that we've uh, seen tonight. Um, so yeah, Michelle and Jeff, thank you so much. Um, and to uh, yes, yeah, so all all our um, other speakers, Magdalena and Angela and James, um, thank you. And so uh, it is 6.44, according to us. It must be much earlier for you, Ed. Um, so <laughs> if you, uh, I wish you a happy good breakfast and everybody else um, have a pleasant evening um, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you, Margaret. Great.